good afternoon, everyone. Um, that whole stage thing is always made to look so much easier when you've got a whole team of like people at these big conferences. So thank you for actually getting it out. It's not easy work. So uh, once again, my name is uh, James Irongo Mwangi. I am the founder and chief executive officer of Africa Climate Ventures. Uh, we're a climate venture fund and venture builder uh, that's focused on achieving or helping realize the proposition that Africa holds part of the key for achieving global net zero and it will transform its economy and transform the global economy by unlocking its particular ability to achieve climate positive growth. So why don't we start with what climate positive growth is and, uh, and then from there go to some of the work that we're doing at Africa Climate Ventures. Um, I'm at the IEA, well, I'm at the OECD speaking to folks who are involved with the IEA, so I'm going to need to be very careful. So what I'll do is rather than uh, throw out too many numbers, also because I don't have my notes in front of me, I'll stick to the general logic of what I'm trying to say. And I will trust that there's a lot of people in here who can tell how all of this fits together uh, quantitatively. Sometimes I'll give some examples. But I'll start by noting that I think there are three fundamental imperatives to getting to net zero. I'll assume no one in this room thinks that net zero is an optional thing or that it's okay to overshoot 1.5 degrees by as much as we are going to overshoot it already. Uh, and if we all align that getting to net zero is urgent, then there are three global imperatives that, uh, that are out there if you look at, or, or from my reading of the IPCC reports. The first is humanity needs to urgently conserve and indeed expand our remaining few natural carbon sinks. Rainforests, grasslands, peatlands, mangroves, etc. The second thing is we need to urgently decarbonize every aspect of global production and consumption. Every aspect. We tend to get anchored on transportation and the energy grid, but that's just the beginning. And we all know about all of the other sectors that need to be decarbonized as well. And the third thing is we need to get real and recognize that we've left it too late. We're going to substantially overshoot and we will need to remove greenhouse gases from the atmosphere over, over and above the natural capacity of our existing systems to do so in order to come back from overshoot. And that means investments in a whole range of hybrid and then engineered carbon removal technologies at potentially unimaginable scales from where we are standing today, right? You read the numbers and we're talking about between five and 15 billion tons of removals needed annually by 2050. 200 billion tons of removals between now and 2050 to begin with. Um, a fraction of which will be potentially done through nature, the rest of which will need new technologies to do. So a very tall order. And some of you are probably looking around saying, well, I thought this guy was gonna talk about Africa. Why, why are we all the way over there? And part of my argument is, or part of what we mean by climate positive growth is that the world under recognizes the role that Africa can play, not just in the first category, yes, preserving uh, natural carbon sinks, but in the other two as well. And I will tell the story of how we go about it by talking about three investments that, uh, that, that we are making or three businesses that we are, that we are invested in. Uh, the first one um, is a company that I'm, uh, I'm really excited about that we've been involved in for a long time called Cocoa Networks. Um, Cocoa Networks is a bioethanol cook stove business. It started in Kenya delivering uh, a high quality uh, cooking solution uh, for homes on the continent. The largest single driver of deforestation in Africa is fuel for domestic heating. It's the largest single driver of, uh, of deforestation and indeed the largest single driver of Africa's current emissions footprint is fuel for heating. That's firewood and that's charcoal. Displacing that uh, and moving uh, households onto uh, newer forms of indoor or, 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 or household heating for cooking in particular accomplishes a number of things. One is the obvious carbon and climatic impact. Two is the biodiversity impact where you're, where, where you're cutting down old growth forests. Three, perhaps most immediately and importantly, is the huge health benefit uh, from getting rid of particulate, health, uh, particulate indoor air pollution. And four, 
is addressing the inequity that exists in the time burden of actually fetching all of this fire, you know, uh, thermal cooking material, which a burden that falls heavily on women. So Cocoa Networks started about five years ago, already serves over 1.2 million households, expanding rapidly across the continent, but is running into the challenge of how do you get into multiple markets? We partnered with them to go from Kenya, where they were already adding households at the rate of several tens of thousands per month, uh, into Rwanda, where we started in, uh, in, uh, in November. Um, and I'm happy to say that as of last week, when I last checked, we were doing several thousand stoves in, uh, per week in Rwanda as well, and on track to hit at least 100,000 stoves by the end of the year, probably reaching more than half a million households in the, in the coming years. Uh, the potential across the continent is huge. That's one angle. So solve cooking and you will, you will add back into the global carbon budget anything between 250 to 500 million tons uh, of uh, CO2 equivalent per annum. Uh, and that's an eminently solvable space. The next thing I'll talk about though is one where you probably did not think of Africa as, 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 as central to the solution. And that's uh, emissions from global consumption and production. Uh, on one level, there's the idea of leapfrogging African countries and African populations to greener technologies. After all, it will be 2.5 billion people uh, on Earth, the fastest growing population on Earth between now and 2050. It makes sense that getting them to be early adopters uh, of greener technologies will be a major lever to hitting net zero. But that's not what I'm here to talk about. What I'm here to talk about is industry, uh, industry in general. Again, usually I get puzzled looks. Africa is only less than 5% of global industrial activity today. Yeah, we can decarbonize that. That's not gonna be too big a prize. But that falls into a trap. It falls into the trap of saying that the way that any country can contribute to global net zero is to decarbonize its current activity as much as it possibly can. That's false. The biggest contribution any country can make is to contribute as much as possible to global net decarbonization because we can move industries around. And so to give an example, we are currently investing in a green industrial park developer that's working to build out the business case for deploying large portions of global compute capacity, essentially green data centers uh, to countries like Kenya. To give you a sense, Kenya, because of its geothermal, wind, and solar assets, uh, currently has a grid that's 92% renewable. That's very exciting. We'll get to 100% renewable probably by the end of this decade. But that's not the, you know, that's also interesting. But that grid is only about three gigawatts today, not because there isn't energy demand uh, among the population, but because we cannot finance a faster growth of that grid there are literally hundreds of gigawatts of energy potential scattered across the country in some of the highest quality wind, solar, and geothermal on Earth. The question is, how do you unlock that supply um, into, into production? And the answer is, bring high concentrations of energy demand. And so that's where things, industries like green data centers, where you do have a high value service. You're not trying to export electrons, you're trying to export value added services that use green electrons to the rest of the world. And the value proposition there is by first focusing on, on, on applications that can tolerate high levels of latency. So for example, uh, AI training and so on and so forth. Stuff that doesn't require too much back and forth. As Not to mention Africa's own growing data center demand you can begin to address what is going to, what is already about 1.5% of global electricity demand and will be as high as three to 4% of global electricity demand by, one, by 2030. You can move a disproportionate portion, uh, share of that to places in the world where you have functionally infinite green electrical headroom. Now, sticking to that, uh, that, that thread of that infinite uh, green energy headroom, I'll come to our third investment. Um, also in the green industrial park space, was we asked what other industries out there are still relatively early in their life, so they have not yet settled in, into existing kind of ecosystems, might benefit from particular characteristics of Africa in terms of its natural resources, its energy endowment, um, and ideally use a lot of energy. 
because Africa's comparative advantage is any industry that requires a lot of energy and ideally doesn't have too many other infrastructure requirements might have an advantage in Africa. And we settled on one that people are often surprised by. We settled on direct air capture. Right? This is a critical part of the long-term equation for global carbon removal. It's a tiny industry today, less than you know, a few thousand tons of, carb of captured carbon uh, in the last few years. By the end of this year, we'll have about 50,000 tons of installed capacity. Maybe we'll be up to a couple of million tons by the end of this decade. The challenge is in order to get those learning effects and to come down the learning curve and cut the cost of direct air capture, which is the, the technology of last resort for carbon removal, we're going to need, deploy at, need to deploy at scale somewhere. Doing this in the places where people are currently doing it, uh, where there's projects planned for Louisiana and Texas, uh, there's a fair amount of capacity being built in Iceland, kind of makes sense, but it's also problematic because every electron, every green electron you take away from shutting down existing emitting uh, energy is taking two steps forward and one step back. You'd have been better off, instead of using that electricity to do direct air capture, you'd have been better off using it to, to, to retire more coal or retire more gas. So what could be better than a place that has the right geology for carbon mineralization? And as I said before, has functionally infinite energy headroom. And that's what East Africa and the East African Rift offers. And that's what our, through Great Carbon Valley, we're trying to put together. And we're partnering with companies like Climeworks and CarbFix to build one of the first uh, global South-based um, you know, direct air capture hub for not just their technology, but to showcase a whole range of other technologies and hopefully to begin to scale them up. And you begin to see how with these types of in installations, you can begin to make more investments in the grid and in energy generation in developing countries bankable, not just by lowering the cost of capital so that they can invest in energy for their own use, but moving global public good uses of energy to the places where we get the highest number of electrons per unit of capital investment. And that's very much going to be concentrated in the tropics, which is exactly where we need to be deploying investment for climate justice and for future equity. So the argument is, don't just look at the climate justice argument for investing in Africa um, on climate. Rather say, actually, is there a role for places like Africa in leading the charge to net zero? And how do we make sure that the climate action is not something that's done for or to uh, places like Africa, but by and with the folks who are over there looking to build the industries of the future and to be part of the vanguard of transforming both global energy and the future of climate action. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, James, for that for that presentation. Um, from what you've said, um, to me, it sounds like there's a clear business case um, when we talk about Africa's potential. Um, you know, the business case is there. Um, why um, have you not seen investments in this at the speed and and the scale you would hope for? So part of it is. Uh, the case is becoming clearer with time, right? So uh, the, the cost of, for example, green energy technologies is, is going off the proverbial cliff, which helps with Africa's comparative advantage. Um, I think also the challenge with the case is it's plagued by that age old problem of chicken and egg. I've talked about this before. Uh, there are no more expensive electrons than those available on African grids. The reason they're expensive is that there is not enough financing to invest in appropriate supply. And when you invest in that supply, you have to pay off huge costs of capital. So the power on the grid is expensive. You can't attract industry. The country stays poor, and thus the power on the grid is expensive. You can go around that circuit forever, all while the best insulation and the best wind and so on is hitting you. And so there's one aspect of this, which is try and talk down the cost of capital or, or, or or somehow buy off some of the, 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 the spreads, the excessive spreads in the cost of capital. 
But the other angle is actually embedding the cost of energy development into new projects and actually focusing not on financing energy supply, but on attracting energy demand at scale. And that work hasn't been done. People have talked about it theoretically, but no one has, to the best of my knowledge, said what would it take to, to bring this one gigawatt user from where they are or where they're thinking of going to this location here where you can deliver them a, a gigawatt of pure green energy. We had a, a guest um, earlier today who said, essentially investors are willing to invest in the production of energy, but there's a whole supply chain of what comes after that where it's hard to you know, get you know, the investment needed to really develop it. Yeah, in a sense, I, I almost think that at this point, we've squeezed as much as we're gonna squeeze out of innovations in financing energy supply. We really need to think about how are we attracting and deploying energy demand or motivating energy demand. And once you have the demand coming, then supply becomes a lot easier to do. If I've got a, a guaranteed offtake from a Fortune 500 company that's coming to use uh, energy in my country, I will be able to get the financing to build the energy plant. Kenya has four gigawatts of pending renewable energy pla uh, you know, plants just waiting for someone to say, I'll buy that, right? Bring the offtake, they'll get financing. Um, how do you change um, you know, the perception of, of Africa as a helpless um, kind of victim um, to um, you know, actually the potential to be to be, you know, that that the, the this this source of of uh, of innovation and um in in to achieve net zero. I think you just have to do it. Um, I think uh, on one level, it's about really anchoring, as we are trying to do in in our work, really anchoring in the pure raw business case of why it makes sense to do some of this work. Um, at times. At times, it is understandable but unhelpful that folks want to layer on all of the other social reasons to do some of these things. It's important to have those in mind, but if you foreground them at the expense of highlighting the business case, then a whole set of assumptions are made by the people who control real capital that actually ironically make it harder to do the things that would do the most good. And so part of what we are trying to do is offer as cold-blooded a set of business cases as possible for why it is advantageous to all parties concerned, owners of capital, innovators, uh, local communities to do some of these transactions. And hopefully you get some of them over the line. I don't think the perception shifts unless you're actually getting stuff done. Um, so talking about it too much is not helpful. Talking like this is kind of helpful because hopefully we can find some partners, investors, uh, and so on in, in the various audiences. But the real value is in focusing on execution, which is what we've set out, mm -hmm. set out to do now. Um, you said in your presentation that um, climate justice should not be the main argument to invest in, in Africa. Um, at the same time, don't you think that it's important that the global south also holds accountable the global north for their responsibility um, in, in the climate crisis? That yeah. It's, it's a good rhetorical point, but what does it actually mean? Um, and, and to be clear, and I don't want to be misunderstood, the climate justice argument is fundamentally correct and vital that everyone understand. It's what motivates me. But unless you've got some means of compelling allocators of capital and deployers of technology to do what you are saying from a justice perspective they should do, then at some point it's, it's outrun its utility and you need to ask yourself, what does it take to get the things you need to do done? And that's going to be about you know, convincing investment committees in various organizations that don't have among their KPIs, climate justice for Africa. You need to get them to decide to make those investments. And that means speaking to them in the language that they understand. So I am not, please, 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 saying that the climate justice movement is wrong. I am just saying it is a necessary but insufficient component of the work that needs to be done today. And sometimes if it's over foregrounded, it can get in the way of the other components that need to be heard just as much, including the fact that there are clear and present business cases for doing some of this. 
Um, you talked about CCS as well um, in, in your presentation. Um, is there a, I mean, there are concerns, of course, um, about the how much we should rely on, on these technologies. Um, should we be careful as well and, and not turn Africa into, um, you know, the, the, the graveyard for emissions elsewhere or? Yeah, I think, uh, so firstly, I was talking about DAC, not, not CCS, and, and uh, they are related but distinct, right? So smokestack CCS will be used to reduce emissions from existing industry. DAC is about ambient CO2. And up until now, no one I've come across, I've not seen a single iota of scientific evidence that says there is any localized harm from doing DAC. You're, you're removing a tiny component. CO2 is evenly distributed in the atmosphere. Essentially, someone somewhere is going to make money from converting energy into CO2 removals. The argument that you should not do it in the global south essentially then boils down to saying that having caused the problem, the companies that should make money from turning energy into carbon removals should also be in the places that caused the problem. Right? This is an industry in which it's not about pollution. We exhale CO2 all the time. It has a whole bunch of negative externalities. It's evenly distributed around the world. It should not matter other than from a position of materials efficiency where this work is done. But at the same time, it could end up being very valuable work and work that could generate jobs and investment. I argue that it's an industry to go after rather than one to shy away from. Keeping a careful eye on whether there are indeed some currently unrecognized negative externalities. But to be clear, we are investing in DAC, but we are also investing in biochar at scale, uh, which is another durable carbon removal technology, and enhanced rock weathering as well, both of which have soil benefits and benefit farmers. They're just not as related to the conversation of today, which is really around the energy system, so I didn't talk about them as much. Um, how do you make sure that as you unleash Africa's potential through the, the invest investment examples that you've presented, um, that people on the ground actually benefit from that? Um, and that it doesn't end up being in the hands of the same people. So the first step is making sure that there's more African participation all the way up and down the, the, the stack of innovation. Uh, I, I said earlier, this is not something to be done to or for the continent, it's to be done by and with. Um, and that means finding innovators from the continent, finding uh, um, inventors, investors, etc., and particularly that last line around investors from the continent. I'm very fr I'm proud of the fact that in our first round of capital raising, uh, something between 60 and 70 percent of our raised capital was from Africa, um, and that was a deliberate choice because we wanted to be sure that if we are we do begin to be successful, the returns are recycled on the continent. And then there's the question of the substance of what you do, and there it's important to look all the way across the spectrum. Like I said, you know. Some, inve some um, interventions, so we are in organic fertilizer and in clean cooking, where you're really engaging with the African consumer as part of your, your, your climate leverage. But you need to also keep in mind that the reason why there's such a struggle to boost livelihoods in many African countries is a lack of global competitiveness, a lack of competitive industry. And so you cannot say, oh, I'm focused on up uplifting people out of poverty, and ignore the biggest single lever for raising communities out of poverty, which is raising countries out of poverty and into competitiveness. And that's where we focus on the industries of the future just as much, where we think the story looks more like what has worked in other places like in Asia, which is attract global industry to invest in the country, bring the skills, and over time you'll have your own national champions uh, emerge. Before you had a BYD, you had a whole range of global uh, industry transfer technology to China. You're seeing the same effect in India, in South Korea, etc. And I think that it's time for Africa to go through that same journey, beginning with attracting the right kinds of heavy industry. Thank you so much, James Mwangi, for your insights. Thank, Thank you. you. Pleasure. Thank you. That brings us to the end of today's uh, Everything Energy Talks. And I'd like to thank 
everyone um, who attended, also our guests for taking the time to share their expertise, their insights, um, and their passion as well. It's been really inspiring to see the diversity of people, um, individuals from different backgrounds with different stories, all working together with um, a same goal, um, which is building the energy systems of tomorrow. So thank you again so much for coming here. And a big thank you as well to the International Energy Agency for hosting this event. Um, the agency's opening plenary is about to begin in about an hour. Um, and you are more than welcome to stay in the room or have a break and come back if you want to um, follow the plenary through this room as it will be broadcast here. Um, so yeah, thank you again. Have a good e afternoon, evening.